We've spent the last three assignments looking at the ideal gas law. And remember, ideal gases are defined by kinetic molecular theory. By definition, they have tiny, tiny particles with large distances between them. The particles are in constant random linear motion. They collide elastically. Their average kinetic energy is measured by their temperature. And the gas particles do not exert force on each other. That being said, ideal gases don't exist. There's no such thing as a perfect gas particle. The ideal gas law is a model to approximate the behavior of gases. It doesn't describe the real nature of gases. The book shows a couple of plots to highlight this. On the y-axis, they've taken PV and divided it by nRT. Well, if PV equals nRT, PV divided by nRT should equal 1. And so they've plotted this line of 1, which is the ideal behavior of a gas, regardless of the pressure. And then they've taken several gases, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, ethene, and carbon dioxide, and plotted what has happened to their PV over NRT value as you've increased the pressure. And you'll notice that at very low pressures, some of the heavy gas particles deviate from the ideal gas law, and then they come back up. But then as you increase pressure, all of the gases get further and further away from the ideal. Here's a zoomed in version at even lower pressures. Same graph, PV over NRT and graphing versus pressure. Here's your ideal trend line at one. And you'll see that some of these gases, hydrogen and nitrogen in particular, hug really closely, but start to deviate as pressure increases. CO2, the heaviest gas particle, deviates most severely. So what makes one gas more ideal than another? Remember, kinetic molecular theory demands that particles are very small. The volume of a gas particle is negligible compared to the volume of the overall gas. So the smaller your gas particle, the more ideal. Hydrogen and helium are much more ideal than carbon dioxide. Also, very weak intermolecular forces are preferred. Remember, gas particles do not exert force on each other. The name of this chapter is, what if there were no intermolecular forces? Well, that would be an ideal gas. There are intermolecular forces. We spent a bunch of time studying them. The stronger your intermolecular forces, the more polar your molecules and the more hydrogen bonding that's present, the less ideal. These intermolecular forces are sometimes referred to as van der Waals forces because van der Waal actually corrected the ideal gas law to show the real nature of gases and fluids. This is his equation. Now this is more than I would ask you to solve. This would be something you would see in an advanced topics course. But you can see that real gases are much, much more complicated than ideal gases. So then let's think about if there's no such thing as an ideal gas, when will gases act more ideally? When is the ideal gas law a better approximation of what's really happening in the world? Well, first, you want low pressures. The lower your pressure, the further apart the gas particles are from each other. Therefore, any intermolecular forces they do experience will have less chance to take hold because of the great distances between the particles. Also, high temperatures are preferred. The higher the temperatures, the faster the gas particles are moving. So even if they experience strong intermolecular forces, the particles will be moving so quickly that they cannot attract each other.